Welcome to Friday Heavy, your guide to the world of aggressive, abrasive, and loud music. Brought to you by the two modern voices behind the movement known as the podcast known as Toon Dig. I'm Cliff. And I am Kyle. And I hope that, Cliff, you practice those in the mirror <laughs> before we record every time. Each episode, for those of you who have never joined us for this delightful little get-together, we concisely cover three things. First, one brand new release in the world of heavy music, which we love and we hope you do too, and more importantly, why we think it'll be worth a spin. Got a banger today. One playlist we've curated to help you explore a heavy subgenre or artist or scene, often related to the new release in some way, and that's definitely the case today. Thirdly, and most importantly by far, one organization tackling a heavy issue by doing critical culture impacting work in their community, because we punk rockers are all we got in this crazy world. And we cover all of that in 15 or 20 minutes, NPR morning commute style, so you can get up, get out, and get something. Cliff, let's get into it. We will. From Pittsfield, Massachusetts, we're going to talk about Escuela Grind. I believe that is Spanish for School of Grind. <laughs> they have already been on the scene for only a few years but they've already got two EPs and a full length out, and they are all super good. I don't know how to verbally communicate the naming convention of the EP, but there's one about power violence, there's one about grindcore, and there is rumored to be one already recorded about death metal. And they are spelled in a way that I don't know how. Power violence! <laughs> Your eyebrows just really sold it. Uh, I hope that we can tell some people about that. They're one of these bands, they're starting to click really quickly. Like, you can see and hear and feel the progression release over release that's coming along really fast. Like, one of those crews that seem like they actually have fun and we're sort of probably meant to do this together in some capacity. I'm going to venture to say there's a strong correlation between those two things. How much fun they're having and how much better they're getting really quickly. Yep. So this looks like that. So out today is their new full length called Memory Theater. Uh, yet another release that we've recently covered off of Monarch Records, who is crushing it at the moment. The reason we're stoked about this release, first of all, uh, I'm a grind fan in general. Songwriting is a loose convention in this territory. <laughs> there is at once no real rule and then also a set of very important rules that you must know about in order to even be considered a band in this genre. But the songwriting specifically from Escuela Grind here is getting, it's really sharp. And they're doing that in a way where not every song has to only be 10 seconds, <laughs> although that seems to be an option if they need to. They've actually got multiple songs over three minutes, which is, you know, by Grindcore standards, a yes album, basically. <laughs> it's uh, Peter Gabriel rejoins Genesis with the Symphony Orchestra orchestra level length on top of their songwriting getting really good the other reason uh, this was recorded and produced by Kerr Blue at God City Studio stop Ooh, me if you've heard this one before on our podcast <laughs> <laughs> this is basically a paid podcast for like two or three producers <laughs> at this point Kurt Ballou and 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 on Toon Dig Juicy J <laughs> So Kurt is really, or seems at least, really good at channeling extremely aggressive bands into honed album length sounds at like almost exactly this point in their career, right? Like they are accelerating, they're growing, they're getting really good, they're honing the craft, and this, this seems to be a really cool moment to let God City kind of figure out how to take a really chaotic, noisy sound that you may have developed live and try to make it sound the same way <laughs> for like eight, ten songs. And so there is some, like, on top of all those reasons, we can already hear from the singles, there is some real depth here, and that's really refreshing in a subgenre that is so visceral and kind of like on its own sleeve all the time. So the album title... Memory Theater references a spe specific historical concept of constructing a space from your own internal ideas and knowledge and perception, right? Like Memory Palace and all that stuff. That's definitely something that I think comes up in neurodivergent circles and things like that. And a really interesting concept in general. 
Uh, but also, and uh, Kyle, I think you threw us a quote in here, but according to the site Brave Words, who gave an interview here, quote, an architect by trade, vocalist Katerina Economo, explores philosophy, politics, and experiential experimentation, building a kind of structure amidst the band's musical cacophony. That is a sentence. An architect by trade. Uh, there have been like three or four instances when we decided we were going to pick this record where one of us messaged the other and we were like, yo, I'm becoming a big fan of this band all the way around musically and otherwise in real time. Yep. So yep. the headline is this band is punk as fuck and we are 100% here for it. I think this is a thing that they wrote, their PR people wrote. It's like from their website. The music might be terrifying, but the overwhelming spirit behind Escuela Grind is a message of empowerment. As they destroy musical boundaries, the quartet attacks the idea of gatekeeping with equal ferocity. In fact, they already serve as a gateway drug to newcomers fighting against the snobbery too oft inherent in extreme counterculture as they gleefully deliver their brutal death grind. I'm going to assume... Send email. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> a thread one slash x i'm gonna assume that they're younger than us from the look of them and i'm i may be missed misgenerationalizing <laughs> but i'm gonna ascribe them to gen z and then if so it reinforces my theory that gen z is cool as fuck and young people are are great and are the true greatest generation. Sorry, misgenerationalizing <laughs> is. <laughs> it's oh like, man, I accidentally <clears throat> did a Charles Barkley impression. Are you a Gen Xer who's been accidentally <laughs> labeled an elder millennial? We're here for you. Only old people. D do you not shit. care? But not in that way. <laughs> we understand. So reinforcing that was a, a cool bit from another interview that they did with Kerrang! back in 2020, one to three EPs ago. They said, one of our goals as a band has always been to promote inclusion and acceptance. Sometimes in this modern grind scene, there can be so much gatekeeping and validation and dismissal of unique members. We just want to help destroy that. We've played some of the craziest mix bills, shows with OG rappers, bedroom pop, gore, harsh noise, Afrofuturist, electronic, metalcore bands, you name it. To be honest, these shows have been some of our most memorable, and we've made so many friends. Grindcore is surprisingly universal in our experience, so we would like to see more mixed bills. Hell yeah. Right on. That's sick. Friday Heavy is not a podcast for gatekeeping mouth breather reviewer type dudes. Those are the, that's the only thing we're trying to gatekeep this podcast from is gatekeepers. <laughs> <laughs> so we are very into that. So let us also then show you the music itself because we've pitched you on the people behind it who seem great, although we've never met them in person. Maybe that'll change one day. In fact, that's sort of a general rule. We try to only talk about people that seem like they'd probably be all right if we met them in person. Uh, it seemed like we we're doing pretty well on that front in general. But the music. As an entry point, it's definitely unpretentious grindcore that is, like we said, kind of almost academically respectful of power violence and death metal. So there are lots of, and especially for the older death metal fans, I think this will connect with you. Like, they write a whole lot of riffs that feel like they were written in the late 90s, but only now, like, fully stood up into a song and recorded. Like... Lots of that real old stuff that you hear where you're like, I wish this riff had bass in at all. Just a ton of those for like three seconds at a time, and then they'll move on to something different, and it's awesome. So it, that's my kind of best intro to the first one we'll play called Cliffhanger. Please don't remind me that my name is included in that <laughs> word. Um, I'm saying that to everyone. Within the sound of my voice, here is that single. The second one we'll play introduces a little bit of a different 
way of approaching the same sort of type of thing. But again, I think you'll keep circling the right airport, just thinking of it as grindcore that is extremely respectful of other like adjacent subgenres and does it really intentionally uh, and then brings it back to whatever they're doing. So this is forced collective introspection. <laughs> If you dig those, plenty more where that came from. Check out Memory Theater out today on Monarch, spelled M-N-R-K. Go listen to it however you want, and then send this band your money through shows, merch, and or direct donation. I think one of them has like a cannabis business, so feel free to explore and support that as well. They definitely have a cool shirt that has a monster made out of weed buds. So I highly recommend that one. I think they were doing tie-dyed versions there for a minute. So That's tight. Uh, yes, 100%. So, Kyle, let's see. Over and over again, in the idea of this podcast, we say, just because we pick a certain new release doesn't mean that you have to build a playlist off of that. We wouldn't want to make things that difficult because that could really pigeonhole. And I think what happens time after time instead is that we totally end up getting a playlist that's sort of based on the original release because if I can get you rolling like two or three artists deep, if even that you need from me, <laughs> then we end up with some sick, like extremely niche genre specific playlist and I'm into all of them. So what did you do this time? This one, it, the direction was energy, but wound up being like very sound adjacent. There's another quote in that same Kerrang article where they said, to us, it's of the utmost importance to see members of the transgender and non-binary community, people of color, females, queers, and other underrepresented people with a platform. So we try to make the most of what we've been given. We also implement crowd work elements from rap shows we've played, like call and response methods. It's almost in the same way that rap shows include punk elements into their world now. They create mosh pits and convince, <laughs> they create mosh pits and convince the audience to do walls of death, and we're with it. Even if it's simple, people look forward to being able to participate. Unifying moments like chanting fuck ice or grind is love with the crowd even gets bystanders who aren't into moshing to let out some pent-up energy. It'd be awesome to see more bands do that. Sometimes it's easy to forget that we make extreme music as an outlet for the realities that we are all dealt with. So this playlist is called Fucking Hostile. And ostensibly, it's a grindcore and power violence playlist, but around the title are puppy, rainbow, and flower emoji, just as a celebration of the inherent tensions that this band has already mastered, right? If you've been in one of these scenes for any amount of time, there is an air of positivity or at least release or certainly supportiveness and it's something that we've hinted at again and again and again when we've had conversations about this kind of music and why we loved it enough to to do a podcast about it in the first place. So whereas one of the more recent ones, like the Holy Fawn Dimensional Bleed one was short in number of tracks and long in length. This one has a ton of songs and is only like a, a CD or and a half basically. So this one is in intended to make you feel like you're getting out and pushing on a skateboard or doing some yard work or getting pumped to go hang out with your friends. Like the tones and the songs are gnarly and the subject matter is kind of gnarly in a lot of cases, but the one common thread throughout is it's energizing. It is it is meant to get you energized and, and raise your vibrations in a way. As usual, I'm just going to pick a run that pumped me up a lot starting around track 13. We got a Vermin Womb song into a Null song, which is a Tennessee grindcore band we are going to keep bringing up. And then into a Gel song, which it feels like they kind of like snuck in the back door a little bit to this one. But I uh, just got to see Gel on Monday in a parking lot and everything was just, yeah, <laughs> just yes. 
uh, everything worked about it. And to your point about, uh, you know, flower emojis and uh, being counterintuitive with the scene in general, for, I don't know if it's timing or intent or whatever, but like me and you have been on like scowl, gel, escuela grind, like a whole bunch of like not just female fronted, but like female driven bands. And like you, you get a lot of flower emoji as you like kind of sit in that awkwardness because like they confront it directly all of them obviously <laughs> i love the scowl logo so much i love all of those bands i am so happy to see women and gender non-conforming people like really really representing and crushing in the scene right now it's fun like the energy in scenes like this are so fun and supportive and like I, it makes me feel like we haven't aged out of it thing things are going really well there like it just in a world in a world with so few things to be hopeful about it just things like this things like this are not one of them thank you to Escuela grind and many of the dope bands on this playlist Hell yeah. Last thing we always cover in this podcast is one organization doing heavy work in their community, doing things that matter and bringing your attention to them so that you can be aware of it, so that you can contribute, and oftentimes so that you can find the equivalent in your local area to have the same type of impact and get involved. Um, one thing that sort of has risen up recently, but also kind of was prompted from, Kyle, you brought up the title of the record we talked about, Me Memory Theater, this kind of idea of what do we know and how do we keep that information and how do we know that we know it later and then how do we actually know that we know the things that we know versus the things that we think that we know that we might not know and just like all of this. One of the more, I think, like counterintuitive truths of our very weird 2022 modern times is this idea that like we have unprecedented access to information through the internet it, it literally unprecedented we've never had this level of access to data to information to thoughts to opinions and experts and yet this has not made us more truthful nor more patient nor better informed because as it turns out people will 100 percent exploit the complexity that comes along with access to all that information at once because access to everything, the fire hose, is itself a complexity that has to be worked through. And so more than ever, what we're noticing is that people in power will look us directly in the eye and lie really clearly without reservation, and they will not apologize later, even if the thing that they're saying to you is verifiably untrue in that exact moment using all the information that's available, using publicly agreed upon ways to dispute it. And so we, we find ourselves kind of stuck here. And one of the endless examples of this that's popped up lately is about bail reform. In places like New York and Chicago especially, city and state leaders are pretty actively trying to blame fluctuations in crime rates on bail reform. It, what they're doing is they're exploiting the complexity of the topic of things like bail reform and other reform ideas and how they impact crime data. But that's all wrapped up, right, in like how is crime data actually collected? Is this the right way to figure out whether crime itself is going up or down? Is the data itself being collected well? Is the data itself being cleaned? Is it being understood appropriately? Like leaders are exploiting the complexity of all of this in order to deflect blame and they're simply refusing to honestly use data that their own departments are collecting. And so this came up to mind because we did talk about bail funds back in our April 1st Friday Heavy episode, uh, which was really awesome. And we spoke briefly then about the pretty obvious injustice of keeping people in jail because they can't afford to pay a government-sanctioned bribe to live their lives until their trial. <laughs> So that was about dealing with the sort of reality of the situation. We want it to be different, but but bail funds are designed to help people out of that reality now. And today, though, what we want to do is highlight an organization that's working to change the situation itself over the long term. Because as we talk about really often, sometimes it's when within one organization or sometimes it's a coalition of organizations, but there's always meeting the needs now and making the change happen long term. Both those things have to be taken care of or else we don't take care of each other actually 
today. And so we want to bring Zealous to your attention. Zealous is a nonprofit criminal justice reform organization, and they support and train public defenders and advocates, and then even others with direct experience in order to shift the narrative around mass criminalization, which bail reform is certainly wrapped up into. Zealous's team and their advisory council are made up of some truly great folks. Like I'm betting if you pay attention in these spaces, you'll recognize some people who are joined up with them. And that should and, and that should give you confidence when you're looking at an organization, right? If people on the team or on the board of advisors are people that you recognize as people able to tell the truth, represent things correctly, speak up, like that's cool. That's a cool way to look into an organization and learn how to support it. And I see a lot of people on that team page that I also see out in public pushing back on lies and false narratives around incarceration and bail reform and all that stuff. And speaking of that, the reason I was reminded about Zealous, the organization, was I had recently read an op-ed by its founder in which he uses public data from New York to directly refute assertions from New York's mayor about fluctuations in violent crime being caused by bail reform. And so this op-ed is just a really simple, like, this is literally not true. Here's how you can know it's not true. Here are, like, here are all the links to all the ways to see that it's not true. Here are all the sub-bullets about why it's not true. And it's all kind of linked up to stuff that certainly the mayor would have access to, but it's otherwise being collected and just needs to be understood and interpreted so that folks actually understand when reforms are helping them and how they can expect to see a reform make an impact once it's actually been implemented. And so that all came back to me really quickly and thought this was a really cool opportunity to bring attention back again, not only to someone solving problems in the moment, but actually trying to change that narrative over time with data. I mean, as a professional communicator, it is wild to me to see this phenomenon play out over and over again, where there's very little accountability from the media, from the support supposed fourth estate when politicians make these kinds of causal statements and do so pretty flippantly. You know, we we see it in our home city of Atlanta about public transit and city jails and police facilities and, and, and. Uh, we see it in San Francisco and L.A. around homelessness and housing. And we're sure that you've seen some version of it in your city or small town as well. And a fact basis is, is the only way to continue to try to push back against the unthreading of reality. So to create change, we must fund access to information and the training of those who can understand and interpret that data and those who can take those facts to the public, um, which, you know, a generation or two ago was just good journalism, but modern times require modern tools. So to learn more about one such institution, Zealous, and support their work, go to zello.us z-e-a-l-o <laughs> dot u-s clever short link hard to say out loud so thank you to zealous if you know any public defenders friends of the podcast out there please get them involved yep because those are the wow i hate this phrase but those are the boots on the ground that's the outcome of this organization that's driving the narrative changes they understand that they must train and deploy public defenders at that level to go in and advocate for people in every instance that they can and then use those same people to spread the word that hey taking care of each other actually helps us take care of each other and doesn't magically cause the crime rate to rise. Um, it turns out that's actually <laughs> negative magical thinking. Boots are for cops, Cliff. They're the casual shoes on the ground. I know, but then like Doc Martens, you know, are also boots and like... And cowboy boots you know. are boots, yeah. Yeah, I feel you. <laughs> <laughs> this has been Friday Heavy. We'll be back in two weeks. <laughs> Go to Toondig.com or follow us on Instagram and Twitter for links to the new release, the playlist, and the organization that we talked about today.